Um, so welcome, good afternoon. Oh, come on. Good afternoon. Thank you. This is going to be an interactive session. So the format is that we have some great presentations and then we really do want to have a Q&A with you all. So if you've come here to have a little doze, you're in the wrong place. We want to have a really brilliant conversation this afternoon. So a bit of an introduction. This is my younger self. Uh, my name is Sally Uren. I'm the CEO of Forum for the Future. I'll explain who Forum is in a moment. But given that we're at the Global Landscapes Forum, I thought I'd dig out a very old photo of me taken in Dallin Valley, where I was doing my postdoctoral research fellowship. So this is all way of trying to establish some kind of authenticity in the conversation this afternoon. So my background is as an environmental scientist. Okay, let's try again. So at the back, can you hear me okay? Right, rewind a moment. That's me in Danham Valley doing my environmental science thing before I became CEO of Forum for the Future, who I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment. What we'd like to do today is to have a conversation which is designed to explore how agribusiness can work with its partners to deliver positive social and environmental outcomes at a landscape level. And we have got a really great lineup of speakers designed to do two things, explore practical ways of scaling up good practice, and hopefully we'll leave this session with some really great insights into, drive, into how to drive effective partnerships. So that's why you're here, you're in the right room, the conversation you were expecting, great. Our panelists, wonderful group of people in front of me um, are as follows. We have Dr. Christopher Stewart, who's head of CRS, Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability at Olam International. And then we have Dr. Gotts Martin, who is head of Sustainability Implementation, Golden Agri Resources. We have a prolific lineup of PhDs here. Dr. Sarah <laughs> Sher, who is the CEO and president of Eco Agriculture Partners. And Miriam, have you got a doctorate too and I just didn't know about it? No, I do not. <laughs> well, diversity is a great thing to have on a panel. Um, and so by last but no means least, Miriam Kuzi, Manager, Forest Landscape Restoration, IUCN. So an incredibly well-qualified and expert panel to help us understand how to drive effective partnerships between agribusiness and others to deliver positive outcomes at a landscape level. So there are panelists. The format is that they've each got 10 minutes, after which time I'll start to wave frantically, um, and they're going to share their insights. And then we do want to open up for a Q&A with your audience. So as you're listening to the panelists, please make a note of any questions that you've got, because we do want to have a conversation at the end. Forum for the Future, I'm very aware that quite a few of you might not have either known me or Forum for the Future. So just a little bit of background as to why I'm so interested in this conversation. Forum for the Future is an international sustainability nonprofit. We've been working now for over two decades with business, with the public sector, with NGOs, trying to accelerate the pace of change towards sustainable development by taking a systems-based approach. So we're trying to catalyze change in whole systems on the understanding that actually incremental change won't give us the solutions that we need to see. Um, I'm based in London, but we have small offices in New York and in Singapore and in Mumbai. We work with a whole range of organizations, and there, Christopher, there's your logo, prominently displayed. Um, <laughs> we work in partnership with a number of leading businesses, including Olam, which is why I'm here today. Um, but a whole range of other businesses, and we also run pre-competitive multi-stakeholder collaborations on a whole variety of issues. And our focus is really on those top three boxes there, trying to understand how to deliver what we call systemic interventions in key challenge areas. And so we're looking at, obviously, the big challenge of our times, how to live within 1.5 degrees, 
We have a whole raft of projects looking at sustainable supply chains and livelihoods, and equally a number of projects globally and locally looking at sustainable nutrition. How do we source food sustainably and deliver food that is sustainable? But underpinning those three thematic areas are what we describe as two enablers. One of those is regenerative agriculture, which is my interest this afternoon. And it is an enabler of those three challenge areas because Regen Ag may allow us to rapidly recarbonize our soil, so solving for the 1.5 degree challenge. It certainly is a, re as a means of delivering sustainable livelihoods and clearly is part of how we fix our broken food system. The other enabler is what we call net positive, and Christopher will touch on net positive in a moment. And this is a project that we've been running at Forum now for about five years with a range of different organizations, mostly corporates, where we've been asking the question, what if brands and businesses could put more back into the environment and society than they took out? On the understanding that simply minimizing our impacts isn't going to allow us to deliver the sustainable development goals. And so I'm going to share with you the four principles that we have defined as really articulating a net positive approach. And as we go through the conversation this afternoon, I'd love us to bear these principles in mind because they do help us raise the level of ambition when we're thinking about change outcomes. And in order to define a net positive approach, what we're saying is we need to embrace that principle of materiality. So focusing on where we can make the biggest difference, which varies according to which sector you're in, of course. Then transparency, perhaps not too surprising as a principle, but if we think about the acceleration we need to see on sustainable development, then transparency is a real enabler of that acceleration. And then the two principles that I think are most relevant for the conversation this afternoon are the principle of regenerative. So in other words, we need to restore the assets in the systems around us. And that goes to the heart of a lot of emerging landscape best practice. And then the principle that's closest to my heart, which is systemic. So really understanding the system in which we're operating. And at its heart, that, that really characterizes a lot of the landscape work that we see today because clearly no landscape exists in isolation and no individual organization can deliver sustainable landscapes working alone. So that notion of net positive, what it takes to put more back into environment and society than we take out, our hope will be a theme that comes to life throughout the conversation this afternoon. So that's all by way of introduction. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Christopher Stewart from OLAM is going to tell us about the living landscapes policy. I'm going to stand, if you don't mind. Uh, I hope this isn't going to create a lot of feedback. Uh, thank you all. It's great to see, actually, how full the room is, given how many competing uh, events there are. Um, uh, so we, um, we organized this session partly because um, I think this is the third GLF that OLAM has attended, either myself or some of my colleagues. And, our impression of this is that there is a huge group of, of people like you out there who are very passionate, very knowledgeable about the sorts of work that we're interested in. But um, there is a big gap between uh, the people who are working in, uh, in academic disciplines and NGOs and the people who are working in business. And I think that, I mean, there are very few business people here at this conference. Yeah. We all like to club together in our own conferences. You guys all like to club together in your conferences. And it's like these two cogs are whizzing around trying to solve a problem without actually ever meeting. But I think that solving these landscape problems can't be done unless you work out how to engage with business and we as business work out how to engage with uh, the world of NGOs and, uh, and researchers who are working on these topics. So a little bit about OLAM before we move on to the first slide. OLAM is a, a global, uh, a global agribusiness working in about 66 countries worldwide. We, uh, we either produce or trade or uh, supply multiple agri agricultural commodities, including such things as coffee, cocoa, cotton, cashew, rubber, palm, timber, a, a very long list. And uh, our speciality is working with smallholder farmers, particularly in the tropics. We estimate that we work with about 4.7 million uh, suppliers, the vast majority of whom are smallholders themselves. Um, but we also 
run large-scale plantations and big farms and contract farming as well. So we're a very, very diversified organization. Um, but one of the special things about us is that we, uh, we try and get as close to the point of production as possible and as close to the farmers as possible. So first slide, please. Oh, you just need to press the green. Oh, Sorry. OK. I'm in control. How wonderful. Um, OK, so when, when uh, we think about agribusiness, whether it's NGOs or consumers, a lot of the time, if we, especially when we talk about big international agribusiness, this is the sort of image that springs to mind. And that comes from uh, decades of you know, very effective campaigning against the sorts of unacceptable practices that agribusiness has, uh, has abused um, over the last few uh, decades. And we're all very familiar with these images of, of degradation, environmental degradation, um, particularly linked with the large-scale plantations or, um, or with uh, uh, industrial forestry, um, and also shocking, uh, shocking impacts on biodiversity. Uh, I think you're all aware of the really hard-hitting reports that have come out this year suggesting that, um, that the world is you know, further than a tipping point in terms of uh, loss of animal population. Um, but uh, these sorts of environmental impacts also have deep and terrible impacts on local populations. Just a selection of images of how bad agriculture has impacted people worldwide. So, um, you know, at the bottom right, you've got the, the Singaporean haze coming from, uh, from peat burning principally in Indonesia, which is affecting tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people uh, directly affecting their health. And we're also losing, through bad agricultural practice, significant amounts of fertile soil across many of the more fragile regions of the world. So bad agriculture is certainly having a major impact on, on the world, on the climate, on people. Um, but how do we change this? I mean, we've been trying to change this in a piecemeal fashion through certification schemes, little projects here and there, um, you know, sort of uh, the, um, the CSR approach. Uh, but really doing this at the sort of the project level really isn't going to change things. Uh, and it's not going to change. The people you need to change are the people in the businesses so that they can feel ownership and want to contribute to a better world. Um, and I think that this is actually, we're at a turning point for businesses as well. Businesses are fed up with these images as well. I feel disempowered at the constant um, flood of bad news coming into my inbox. I don't want to be a part of that. And many of the people that I work with in business don't want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of something which is going to build uh, natural capital as well as uh, a, a thriving business. And regener regenerative agriculture is not a new concept, but I think that in the rush to the green revolution, we've all forgotten a little bit how to do it as a profitable business. But the methods are, are, are well known, and, and the time has come again for business to invest seriously I I in uh, regenerative agriculture. And it's really about building natural capital to meet our human needs. If we all do less harm over time, that's great. But you know, by 2050, trying try to feed another 2 billion people, we're just doing less harm at a bigger and bigger scale. We actually need to invest into building natural capital and rebuilding landscapes and restoring landscapes so that they can provide for us um, uh, and for the next generations. And it's actually a, a very, in, it's a very um, positive um, thing to communicate internally uh, to, to our own business. Since we launched our new living landscapes policy, I've had dozens and dozens of emails internally from my own people who you know, aren't all that thrilled about certification schemes, but are going, how can we contribute to this new movement? And I think it's very empowering to give people the tools uh, to, to, uh, to build something positive. So that is why earlier this year we launched the OLAM living landscapes policy. Um, and our ambition in this policy, on the one hand, is to eliminate the unsustainable practices, the, uh, the, the no, no, um, no high carbon stock, no high, no, no high conservation value, uh, no burning, no peat, uh, no exploitation. All of these no's, that's kind of the boundary conditions. That's what we're all used to hearing people saying, you must not do this. But we want to have a yes, please proposition. 
Um, and that's why we launched our Living Landscapes policy, which is about having a triple positive impact uh, on um, uh, farmer prosperity, um, livelihoods of farmers. If they're not economic, they won't continue to produce food. Um, they need to live in communities which, uh, which actually sustain uh, rural living. People don't want to live in communities without electricity or water or healthcare or education, and young people leave such communities. So actually, as a business, we need to contribute to that as well. And the healthy ecosystems are essential to providing the, the, um, uh, the uh, life support systems that, that we as farmers and people who source from farmers require. So we're building this living landscapes policy into our commercial model, and we're looking for partners to be able to uh, co-finance and to deliver uh, the parts of the business that we can't easily do as a business. We can invest into our own supply chain and into the farmer livelihoods and better quality of food and, and uh, providing the farmers um, with the tools to get more yield and more income. We can also help them in their communities, but it is very difficult for a business to act at the landscape scale to restore natural ecosystems beyond the farm gate unless we have a clear understanding with other people, other actors in that landscape about where their responsibilities lie and who is responsible for doing what. So I'm going to, um, I'll come back to some examples I think in the Q&A about how we've been trying to do this uh, in a cocoa landscape with, uh, with a, a great partner, uh, Rainforest Alliance in Ghana. I'm, I'll, I'm running out of time a little bit for, you for are. that. Um, uh, in fact, you've run out of I've time. I've run out of time. But, um, but you're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. So I want to leave you with this image that, that we believe as a business, and we have tried it on the ground, that it's possible with the right partners and the right investment and the right investment time frame to achieve living landscapes where people and uh, natural ecosystems coexist. And I think that that is the way of the future. It, we have to do that, otherwise, as a species, our, our future is going to be rather dark. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and now for our second speaker, Scott. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working for the industry uh, which many people, maybe even in this room, uh, love to hate. I'm, I'm working for a palm oil company. Um, a quick introduction. Um, <clears throat> so I'm working for Golden Agri Resources. Golden Agri Resources is part of the Sinar Mas group, which is a large uh, Indonesian uh, conglomerate. Um, you can read uh, the slides, but I think what is not written there, what is quite interesting, so we are um, uh, sourcing, as, as it says here, from 420 something mills. Um, which then again indirectly source from 150,000 smallholders. Um, uh, we are sourcing directly from 100,000 smallholders. Um, uh, GAR is operating more than 150 clinics in very rural uh, landscapes where there is no uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, and we are uh, teaching uh, 20,000 uh, students um, for free um, from elementary school until senior high school. Um, that is GAR plus all the commercials, uh, uh, what, you, what you see on the slide. Um, therefore, very quickly, I have a split. I'm, I'm talking a bit on how we engage our uh, suppliers, uh, commercial suppliers, and then how we are acting within the small landscapes uh, where we are operating uh, by ourselves. Um, on the suppliers, you have seen there are many uh, players. And... Um, what you need to know is that it's very often medium enterprises, companies um, uh, which have one plantation maybe or have one crude palm oil mill. And uh, you need to imagine this is mainly kind of family businesses in Indonesia. Um, the, the skill level, the understanding on sustainability matters is relatively uh, small. Um, or low, uh, these, these companies are uh, overwhelmed with the requests and the expectations uh, they should meet uh, in their operations by the Western world. And what these organizations therefore need, companies need, is uh, support. 
Um, it doesn't help if you are excluding them from, their from your supply chain. There is a, a, there is a growing market for, for no commitment palm in India, Bangladesh, China, uh, whatever non-sustainable palm uh, will be produced, it will be sold and there are buyers for it. Um, um, so so if, if people stop consuming palm oil in Europe, it will not uh, prevent uh, that that palm is not grown. Um, so it's, it's quite important to understand that there is sustainable and there is non-sustainable palm and making also these differentiations. Okay, so anyways, a long, long story short, engagement is key. So we have developed multiple formats, um, uh, um, broad socialization sessions, which we call smart seed, and then there's small, um, uh, smart uh, spots, which, which is kind of, 14, 15 companies, we talk about specific uh, topics, no deforestation or peat or labor is now uh, becoming increasingly important. Uh, and, and then we have um, uh, something, cooperation for transformation, where we are hiring consultants who work with these uh, small companies to you know, write up new standard operating procedures and, and really bring the very basics uh, into into the game. Uh, so engagement is very important and, and it needs to be ongoing. There need to be different formats being used uh, and not just um, uh, dump them. Um, <clears throat> however, you see, right, a, a big request from many NGOs is, you know, they need to be suspended. And you see, if companies um, uh, don't, need, don't um, kind of want to engage with us or, or they walk away or they don't change their practices, you can see in the uh, number of suppliers that there are changes over time um, and uh, uh, that we are trying to select um, uh, more, more sustainable suppliers. Anyway, so you know that is just a kind of a, a very large supply base and, and we believe through this continued engagement we can slowly transform uh, the industry so that they meet um, our, our kind of uh, uh, sustainability standards. I think, however, more important now, if we really talk about um, you know, physical uh, landscapes and what makes me really kind of excited is, is how we engage with our um, uh, communities. As I said, there are around 200 communities which are within our plantations or are overlapping with our uh, plantations. And what is quite interesting is that uh, a large chunk of the remaining forests uh, in kind of uh, uh, the, the typical Indonesian mosaic landscapes are, are within these villages surrounding our concessions. Um, so here is an example. You have, it's kind of uh, uh, one large concession. Within that concession are nine different villages. The, the violet pink color is the, the um, the village boundaries um, and the, the, the solid black line is our concession boundaries and you can see larger forest patches uh, within <coughs> uh, and, and outside of, of our concessions. Um, I think for sure what is important, we have a commitment, uh, no deforestation, we, we are following the, uh, the high carbon stock approach and, and so obviously as you can see the forests don't stop at the, at the concession boundary, right? And, and so we, we understand that we have this responsibility uh, to engage with the communities to protect uh, their forests um, inside and outside um, uh, our, our concession. Um, I, I think what is quite important and what I want to throw out here um, is, is that um, these, these engagements cost money, um, uh, a significant amount of money, and, and so far um, we don't see a lot of money arriving in these areas from, from other sources than our own bank accounts, Sinamas uh, or GAR bank accounts. So please, if you have a big uh, bank account, uh, <laughs> feel free. Is there anyone from IDH to, in the audience? To, 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 to contact me later. There is significant finance really needed uh, to implement um, uh, landscape conservation in these rural areas. Um, so then after uh, quite a while, we have together with um, uh, our implementation partners, TFT and Greenpeace at some stage, um, developed a, a relatively complicated and, and lengthy process, uh, which kind of um, at the end uh, of the day um, uh, culminates in, in, in three deliverables. Um, uh, deliverable one is, is an agreed conservation area uh, with, with the communities. Um, uh, second is 
also agreed areas for economic development and the company is providing different livelihood uh, models uh, for these uh, communities um, for a period of three years and, and, and then we hope um, that these um, communities can run by themselves. And then most importantly uh, for me, I think um, at the end of this process, um, these communities will get land tenure, um, which means that the uh, two minutes that the customary land uh, boundaries, uh, which they all know, are finally put on paper and acknowledged by the Indonesian government. Uh, and that is very uh, Im important, uh, one of the key deliverables. Um, what I just wanna show is, is also what is, what is very important when we talk about landscapes, and I saw this beautiful um, kind of um, big slide in the big plenary room which shows that beautiful landscape, and what I realized there, you can clearly see how dynamic this landscape is, right? So this is not a pristine primary forest anymore. You can see human activities everywhere, but they are, the community was able to retain this very nice um, uh, green, green landscape, and that allows um, dynamics. Um, what you often have is that um, we come in, uh, companies or NGOs or scientists and say, okay, here are the conservation areas you need and you know, you cannot access these areas anymore and you need to step out. But the communities have a very different perception. Um, uh, when we did the first participatory mapping, you see only the small green areas on the right side, that's what they uh, agreed to conserve. And, and we were coming with the left uh, side slide. And uh, so we were quite uh, apart and it took a very long time, many discussions, very participative process. And then at the end of the day, we are ending up with a village plan, <coughs> which uh, unfortunately is in Bahasa, but we are, we are kind of now defining similar, similar graph like uh, uh, Chris uh, showed, maybe not as, as nicely designed, but it shows also an integration of conservation development needs within that uh, uh, particular village area, I'm, I'm looking forward for the questions coming in the Q&A, thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Great, we can ask our third speaker to come up. Yeah, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to be in this session. Uh, Eco Agriculture Partners has been working since 2002 on integrated landscape management, on partnerships with agriculture environment, lo local people working on livelihoods and other actors. But we didn't start working on, on agribusiness and food industry in a very serious way into, until 2012. And that was stimulated, as I'll mention in just a moment, by the fact that there were so few private companies in all of these landscape partnerships. And we were trying to understand why weren't they there and what would it take for them to be part of it. If you jump forward to 2018, that has changed enormously. I mean, the vast majority of agribusinesses are not yet doing landscape work, but the number that are, the creativity is really quite astonishing. Um, so what I wanna do is just briefly give you a little bit of that background and then uh, speak to a project that, uh, where's Ruth over here, uh, the Global Agribusiness Alliance has started as part of their new uh, a program of work with partners, one key pillar of which is uh, sustainable landscapes. And so we worked with them on some initial scoping results of a few, uh, looking at seven uh, specific agribusiness um, landscape partnerships to try to start, start examining what, what they look like today. So we move to the next slide. This is for you. Okay. E oh. oh. Sorry. Uh, there's a lots of landscape partnerships. Between 2013 and 2015, Eco Agriculture Partners and the Landscapes for People Food and Nature Initiative, which is a group of about 75 organizations worldwide, went out to try to document where are their landscape initiatives where agriculture and environment and sustainable development were all being addressed within landscapes through multi-stakeholder platforms. And the criteria was they had to have been around for at least two years, they needed to have multiple objectives, they needed to have multiple stakeholders, and there was a couple of other, of other initiatives in there. Um, the, the ones that you see, the four continental reviews that have been done by, by ICRAF in Africa, by, the, um, by um, uh, Cartier in Latin America, by the Hercules program in Europe, and by uh, EMI in, in Asia. Um, came up with uh, 428 of these large-scale landscape partnerships um, that were around, and we got some sense of the stakeholders that were involved with them. 
What we found, however, was that overall only 22% of them actually had any private sector businesses that were involved. And they were all agricultural landscapes. And 95% of, of agriculture is private sector. So we were asking ourselves, what, what's going on? This did vary it from a low of 8% of the landscapes in Africa to over 30% of the landscapes in Asia, but still, still, in our view, pretty low. So we started a project called uh, Business for Sustainable Landscapes as part of Landscapes for People, Food, and Nature. And we got a group of uh, large international companies together with NGOs like IMCN that have been working with companies for some time to try to diagnose the lack of participation, what were they looking for, and, um, and what would it take to get much more engagement of, of agribusiness within these partnerships. Um, and there was, a, this, there was an action plan that was developed that I don't have time to um, describe in detail right now, but I encourage you to look it up, Business for Sustainable Landscapes Action Agenda, and you'll find it. And there was an action agenda, an agenda there for governments, for landscape programs, uh, for finance. All three of those were identified by the companies as significant constraints to their being able to work in landscapes. But there were also a set of recommendations specifically for businesses. Uh, one of them was that they should be much more uh, rigorous about evaluating internally whether or not they need to be part of a landscape partnership. Secondly, that they needed to build staff capacity to do the various things that you need to do. Um, thirdly, that they should be doing, um, they've got to figure out strategically how and when and where they want to partner and what roles they want to play. And a, a, a fourth one is that they um, need that business needs to have their own peer learning process uh, for understanding what it takes to be part of, of landscape partnerships. Um, I used to was a key key leader in this in this initiative as well, uh, and Olam was also a major a major partner in this. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that I think that what Global Agribusiness Alliance is doing is is speaking to that latter recommendation that came out, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Um, and what, what we uh, sat down to do, and I want to give a shout out, you can go online and find uh, the overview of these seven cases, uh, plus the seven cases, they're short case studies. This is a scoping exercise, not an in-depth analysis. But uh, we looked at seven very different landscape partnerships, um, and I'll briefly just tell you who they are. Um, one of them was um, New Forests which is a global company, that, and the case study was on investing in carbon forestry in California. Um, second one was Bayer, that's working with a partnership in the United States across sectoral collaborative action to protect the upper Mississippi River Basin with row crop areas. Uh, Olam, a, a case in Tanzania on delivering responsible water stewardship at the catchment level. Golden Agri Resources in Indonesia looking at sustainable palm oil landscapes. So it was just, just presented to you. Um, April's work in Indonesia on advancing peatland restoration. Philip Morris International's work in Malawi towards sustainable tobacco sourcing. And Tutan's work in Ghana on responsible stewardship of, of landscape, of, I'm sorry, of cocoa partnerships. Um, I was struck by the extraordinary diversity of the approaches that the companies were, were using. I really encourage you to read them. They're absolutely fascinating. To, to, and for us at EcoAg, we were really excited by the kind of innovations that we were seeing. And all I have time to do right now is just summarize a couple of the broader um, issues that came out of looking at these seven, the seven landscapes. Um, the, the first one was that they had quite different entry point, points that, uh, of concern uh, environmentally that led them to be part of these. Um, avoided deforestation was key for the Philip Morris, the April, the Teuton, uh, and the Golden Agri Resources piece. Uh, forest restoration was really key for new forests in California and also with global agri resources. Um, water pollution was the big driver for the partnership in the United States with Bayer, with Bayer of which Bayer was part. And um, water supply was the big issue for Olam in, in Tanzania. So those were the sort of things that drove the initial partnerships. But if you back up then and say, what was the business rationale for engaging in landscape partnerships? What was striking about all seven of these cases is that these were not corporate social responsibility activities. These were really very much went to the core business interests of the, of the companies. 
Um, in the case of New Forest was the clearest. They were making a lot of money off of doing this, uh, the carbon forestry work. It's nice to hear someone working in carbon forestry is making some money. Um, um, a number of the groups were particularly concerned about the loss of revenues that was going to happen by things like water scarcity that was going to fundamentally undermine their business proposition. Uh, I think it was the case in Olam in Tanzania. Um, you had groups like uh, PMI and, and April that were just wanting to demonstrate that there were sustainable ways of, they, they were basically trying to demonstrate business models that they were taking on board as, as, as companies. Um, and, then, uh, and then there was the interest among many of them in reputation issues and showing that they were meeting commitments that they'd made globally. But uh, I think in most of these particular cases, those were, um, were secondary um, uh, efforts. Although in a few cases, license to operate in the particular places was, was an issue. Um, institutional arrangements were really diverse. Um, and the role of companies in them, um, most of the work that Eco Ag Partners has done have been these multi-stakeholder platforms for landscape partnerships. And what we found in looking at just these seven cases is that there were a couple of them that were really involved in multi-stakeholder partnerships and they were, they were among the leadership cadre in those multi-stakeholder partnerships like, like the example of Teuton in the, in the cocoa landscapes. Um, there also were a couple where the, the business ran some multi-stakeholder partnerships that they led and they were part of multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships, uh, which was the case in New Forest and, and, and Olam. You also had some that were definitely, all the partnerships were led and developed and managed by the company, as in the case of, of Philip Morris. And, uh, and then you had the example of Bayer, where you actually had a coalition of companies and NGOs from the region that developed the multi-stakeholder platform. So I think we have a lot of, there's a lot of rich material to learn a little more about how and why these different institutional configurations came out. Um, the businesses played a lot of different roles in these, in these partnerships. Um, so institutionally, sometimes they were the conveners or a lead partner or they were facilitators, but they also were involved in generating financial, developing financial innovations that were used by the two financial innovations, um, a lot of tool development. A lot of these companies came up with tools that would help address their problems that actually probably have quite widespread uh, potential application in, in other places, whether it's uh, for the land tenure kind of work uh, or the, um, some of the technical design work around conservation, uh, et cetera. Uh, a lot of innovation, technical innovations that they were uh, sparking that were potentially going to be used by, by others as well. Um, and, and then issues such as monitoring. Some, some of them, they were taking a lot of responsibility for monitoring impacts um, at the landscape scale. Um, also, just wanted to mention about engaging farmers, which was a key issue for a lot of the organizations and, again, why motivated a lot of them to work in landscape partnerships. And um, the uh, New Forest was working with indigenous peoples organization in California. Sometimes they were engaging with farmers as service providers, something they were providing incentives, such as the incentives of facilitating access to tenure or funding for infrastructure and things like that. They're really, and then the other one, of course, was a very widespread role in, in technical assistance. So I think we also can learn a lot about what was working and what wasn't working, what was the division of labor with other actors in those landscapes around providing technical assistance, incentives, et cetera. Um, and my final point was uh, about the role of government, uh, which we haven't explored in great depth yet, but it is quite interesting. There's been um, a feeling by a number of these groups that it just simply wasn't legitimate for a, a large private company to take a leadership role in a landscape partnership. Um, and therefore, they, they took steps to make sure that they had other partners, other co-leaders of the initiative that would, in their view, legitimize it. Others went even farther uh, to say that they really felt they only wanted to do this within the context of a jurisdictional uh, kind of a landscape program because they wanted the government, and, you know, the government to definitely approve what was going on. Um, in, in other cases, uh, the companies felt that they really uh, wanted to have the flexibility of leading the partnerships themselves and were somewhat uh, concerned and ha had some reservations about trying to bring in too many other partners that this might slow things down. Um, and in some places you see changes going on. Um, in, in one of the cases, uh, there had been very strong company leadership. It was going really well. 
The government felt that it was a little too much. They wouldn't formally endorse it, so there was some changes in the institutional arrangements. So I actually think, and this was a finding also of the Business for Sustainable Landscapes Action Agenda, is that government, governments actually need to have more clear policies about what's acceptable, what's not, what level of engagement, how do they get legitimacy, et cetera. But anyway, um, this is just the first first round of this, but I think it was encouraging to see the level of creativity and interest, and I think we need to speak to the question about where are the profit, you know, how is this enhancing profits or, or just avoiding, avoiding risks. Risk reduction was by far, five years ago, the major reason why companies were getting involved in landscape partnerships, but I think we're starting to see it turn around in some of these places where people really see it as, as, as very beneficial to their businesses, so we will all keep watching. Thank you, Sarah. And if we could switch to the second presentation now, if you wouldn't mind. And last but by no means least, Miriam. Hopefully your slides will appear as if by magic. Brilliant. Oh. Okay, let me just check this one. So um, working on forest landscape restoration, I would uh, like to reflect with you on what that can do for generating net positive agricultural supply chains, creating new partnerships, and the sustainable management of landscapes. Forest landscape restoration is about all land uses, often in mosaic landscapes, as you can see here. For the large part, Forest landscape restoration takes place on agricultural lands. In Rwanda, more than half of the landscape restoration opportunities identified are agricultural. And in many countries in Latin America, the main objective for doing forest landscape restoration is to increase productivity for agricultural supply chains. Forest landscape restoration is about hope. It is a positive message and net positive results as opposed to perhaps talking about reducing deforestation and degradation or achieving land degradation neutrality. Its message is very clear that we can go beyond that to put back into ecosystems, landscapes, and supply chains what has been lost. Through forest landscape restoration, it is possible to increase biodiversity. We recently at the COP um, launched a working paper on how forest landscape restoration is achieving IGHI targets. Um, and it is biodiversity that's shown to have very positive impacts on pests and diseases in supply chains. FLR helps build soil and enhances soil conservation. I don't think we talk enough about the aspects of soils and which is needed to increase productivity and water retention as well as sequestering carbon. For example, on carbon here in Mexico, we can see what the potential impact is on forest of forest landscape restoration on nationally determined contributions and GDP. This is based on increased productivity and in carbon storage. Biodiversity and carbon, and all those are just some examples of what the geo, uh, bio, uh, physical aspects are of forest landscape restoration. However, sustainable supply chains depend also on, uh, there you go, good land stewardship at the landscape scale, on the people who live and depend on these landscapes for livelihoods in rural development, for increasing resilience in the face of climate change. We're talking about the communities, farmers and smallholders, agricultural cooperatives and entrepreneurs. Forest landscape restoration is about enhancing human well-being and rural development across landscapes to meet those present and future needs, working on a multiple benefits approach and land uses over time for a very wide range of stakeholders. There's no one fit all solution and um, IUCN uses the restoration opportunities assessment methodology. Some of you may know it. It's pictured here, Rome, to assess forest landscape restoration opportunities that are socially, economically, and ecologically appropriate. And IUCN is a lot about best science and best knowledge and generation of information. 
Rome's are stakeholder-driven stakeholder processes combining best science and best knowledge to equip those decision makers, private corporations, communities, and smallholders with the best available knowledge to plan for and implement forest landscape restoration and thus appropriate interventions in supply chains. Having an evidence base for targeted interventions is critical and we have assessed over 500 million hectares of land to date and have generated an evidence base for landscape restoration in 160 million hectares. Again, a large part of that is in the agricultural domain and directly impacting sustainable uh, supply chains. It is important to dispel the often held myth that forest landscape restoration displaces land uses, that it is about going back to some form of original forest or vegetation. Forest landscape restoration is forward-looking to meeting societal challenges as land becomes ever more scarce. It's about intensifying production systems through adding trees or woody species in agricultural landscapes and restoring degraded forests in wider landscapes for sustainable supply chains. It's about common business sense. If we consider the wider range of stakeholders and their needs, from governments to corporations and smallholder farmers, then using a landscape approach to meeting those needs and tapping into ongoing movements is a key for partnership building. And in this partnership building, for example, in Africa, many countries have made commitments to the AFR 100 initiative of restoring 100 million hectares by 2030. In fact, this demonstrates the huge political will of African leaders and their recognition by them of forest landscape restoration as a nature-based solution to the many challenges they face and has led, in fact, to the target of 100 million being surpassed in less than three years. Governments are putting into place policies and strategies to restore degraded landscapes that will positively impact the sustainability of agricultural supply chains, livelihoods of people, and rural development. Private sector corporations can be a very significant actor in implementing those policies, strategies, and plans, and in creating public-private partnerships and new partnerships with farmers and cooperatives. Through the application of Rome at national and subnational levels, we can quantify the benefits for the different stakeholder groups, where some benefits are more in the domain of the public sector, absolutely but others for smallholders or private corporate sector. We can demonstrate the benefits of forest landscape restoration for supply chains from recent Rome processes and will be initiating new Romes specifically to achieve sustainable supply chains on sugar, cocoa, coffee, cotton, and mixed agricultural crops in countries such as Peru, Tanzania, Ghana, Mozambique, El Salvador, Mexico, and others. We will be looking at soil building and conservation to increase productivity as well as water retention and erosion measures within the landscapes to support supply chains and partnership building with smallholders, communities, cooperatives, and governments. We'll be looking at fuel wood issues as this is an important element in sustainable management of supply chains across the world. In forest landscape restoration, the entry point for land management is not just restoration of degraded land, but also conservation and protection. We need a whole landscape approach, whereby all elements work together to support agricultural supply chains, people's livelihoods, rural development, resilience to climate change, and governance of these resources. As mentioned, we've been using Rome to make forest landscape restoration actionable. During those processes, a theory of change for drivers of degradation is established within local context and local contextual objectives for doing forest landscape restoration. This is important for uh, interventions to be relevant to local context and adopted. The situational analysis and associated theories of change are at the foundation of forest landscape restoration policies and plans and is important in the context of reimagining global agriculture. We need these large-scale transformational changes at the landscape level and in supply chain management. During assessments such as Rome, a wide range of stakeholders at different levels come together to identify opportunities for forest landscape restoration and negotiate the trade-offs that can positively impact supply chains. 
companies do not always have access to these stakeholders. Spatially explicit planning was another point that I wanted to mention here because it's important that it is spatially explicit to generate positive returns, to be able to track what we are doing and is key to sustainable land use planning and management. At national levels, assessments feed into national planning and policy and tend to be a bit more general uh, or higher grained. At subnational levels, assessments feed directly into local level planning. Moreover, uh, to complete the presentation, I think assessments and uh, getting that evidence base also provides baselines for tracking impacts of forest landscape restoration and supply chains. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to turn my chair around so I can see you all. Uh, so I have got a question for each of you, if I may be so bold. And then I'd like to come to the audience. And I'm going to have to stand up because I realize I can't see a lot of you over there. Um, but first of all, before we um, pass over to the audience, so please get ready with your insightful and probing questions because that's the criteria we're looking for. Um, going all the way back, Christopher, though, first to your description of living landscapes, what I'd love to hear from you is the example of the application of the policy that excites you the most when you think about the role of partnerships within the delivery of that policy. You were about to tell us before. Back, I, I, well, I, I, I'm not actually. I'm not going to tell you in detail about uh, our Ghana case study, partly because uh, out of an act of extraordinary um, uh, kindness, I'm going to point you to uh, the GAA um, write-up, which was done for uh, Tuton, who are another company who worked in the same landscape and took over the uh, the, the Rainforest Alliance partnership in 2014. So we had a Rainforest Alliance uh, partnership uh, working on climate smart cocoa. Tuton uh, uh, worked with the same partner in the same landscape and we have now started a new uh, partnership a little bit in a, in a slightly different area uh, called the Sui River. So if you want to know about co uh, climate smart cocoa in Ghana, uh, go and have a look at the case study that uh, uh, the GAA has just written up. Um, I think, so in response to your um, question, Sally, I think that one of the things that is happening now with, with food is that especially, uh, especially in the West, but also increasingly in the affluent Asian countries, people want to know where their food is coming from. There's been enough scandals about um, uh, uh, food that's contaminated or food that contributes to unacceptable things that people, and especially the younger people, really want to know where their food is from. And for me, I think that is where the real hope is because people want to know specifically who's produced their food and they want to know that it's, uh, it's been good for somebody. And actually, I think this is a real, this is a real change for us in, in, in agribusiness. Rather than producing something which is completely homogenous, this gives us a real opportunity to go to the consumer and give them something which has added value. And the big problem, I think, is that food is too cheap. Food, you know, food has, uh, the, the proportion that people have spent on food has decreased and the pressure is always down on producing food. But if we're not, and if we, if we produce the cheapest food, it's going to be cheap because it's going to be damaging and done in the worst possible ways. And so I think the, 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 the really hopeful thing for me is that with the increased transparency that we have through satellite imaging, through videos, um, uh, social media, people are starting to know really where their food is coming from. They take an interest. And for me, that's a real turning point because for us who are interested in landscapes, that means we have an opportunity to say, we can go all the way back to the farmer. We have those tools. They, they exist already. What is missing now is kind of the chain to take the, the story of the farmer and the environment that they're living in and, and with all the way back to the consumer. And I think that's really where the excitement is coming and where the partnerships come in because we, we as a big agribusiness aren't necessarily going to be trusted by the consumer. But I think with the brand value and with uh, partners who have a, a, global, uh, a global footprint, we can really create that trust and, and create something really new. So I think we're on the cusp of something really exciting there. So you talked then about effectively an unlock for 
trying to build more resiliency into the food system by harnessing that lever of transparency. If I could just take you back to the living landscapes policy, though. Um, what I'm really curious to know is why do you think partnerships are so critical to deliver that policy? Well, it's partly because um, we believe that as an actor within landscapes, in most landscapes, a company like ours, even a huge company, doesn't have all the levers, right? We can't change things without bringing people together. In some landscapes, we're, we, you know, we, are, we are such big players that we really can drive things. But unless we can convince other companies and NGOs to come in together and to, to also communicate very strongly to, uh, to local authorities, then you can't get that enabling environment that, that drives positive change. So I think this is where, um, where we want to have a net positive impact. We need to explain what is the role of companies, where do companies invest within their supply chain, what is, and where are the limits of our responsibilities, and how can we bring in other forms of financing and other forms of investment that are going to achieve the other aims of, um, of, of landscapes, notably around the, the, um, the, the wider environmental aspect. Great, thank you. Um, that takes me really nicely to my question for Gotts, if I may. Um, you talked about the fact that at the moment, investment isn't particularly forthcoming, particularly into regions such as Indonesia. Why is that and what needs to change to harness bigger swathes of risk tolerant capital to scale up some of these approaches? Oh. In your humble opinion, <coughs> yeah. we won't hold you to it. No, that's a, the, I hope uh, Chatham House rules here, right? Um, so I, I think... You're on video. <laughs> <laughs> I am very um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I think there are multiple levels, right? I, on, on the one hand side, um, I think the donors um, have a lot of very difficult um, requirements and safeguards, and it's very uh, complicated in a country like Indonesia um, uh, that communities who might receive these funds uh, are seen as a, as a reliable kind of partner to receive that finance. I, I think that, and, and financial illiteracy is still very, very common for sure in these, in these communities. And so then what is often the alternative is that money will be channeled through companies or, or companies will be um, um, safeguarding these um, uh, investments. And that's also not a role a company necessarily wants to play. I, I think so there is a, it, it's a lot of, in my opinion, it's a lot of risk at, 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 uh, um, there is a lot of risk adversiveness. Mm -hmm. um, um, so if I see it, you know, just take um, Red Plus as an example. Uh, back in 2008 and 9, there was a lot of excitement about Red Plus and Norway, one billion, and of that money, hardly anything has made its way into Indonesia, uh, right? And then when you have a choice between selling off your illegally cut it locks or you wait another five years, if eventually at some point of time the Norway money comes, you cut off the lock. This is no, it's no question, right? And I, think, and I think so what needs to happen to make these projects happen is, is the money comes, comes at the start um, and, and that with a bit of trust. And then if the money comes, you will see that the communities are excited or companies are getting excited and, and, and see that value and make that decision pro uh, conservation and pro landscape management and not only for kind of non sustainable exploitation. Okay, um, thank you. I did have another little question for you, if I um, may. You talked also about the great partnerships that you have in the delivery of some of your ambition. I'm just curious to know, can you pick out three critical success factors for great partnerships? So when you look at those partnerships that you mentioned, what characterizes a really great partnership? I think the key is, or was, that all partners who are involved in this partnership have a very good local understanding. Um, uh, also, you have seen the landscape we, we are working is the landscape is, is relatively small, right? It's, it's not a province or it's not a, it's not a jurisdiction uh, as such. But I know um, pretty much each and every village elder who lives there. I, I know the decision makers. I can meet them on a daily basis if I want to go there. And I think that common understanding on what the needs and the aspirations um, from these local communities are who, who live there, that is uh, very critical. And so you need to pick your local NGOs. It doesn't help necessarily if there is a, 
a big international NGO. I think they can play a nice advisory role, but if it comes to implementation, it has to be a local NGO, speaks the local language, understands the customs and, and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Local so, knowledge. Great, thank you very much. Mm. Sarah, just reflecting on the statistic that you shared, which described the number of agribusinesses involved in landscape level initiatives, quite low. What, in your view, is needed to increase that percentage? That actually was the focus of this Business for Sustainable Landscape initiatives, and what we realized is that it does require action from all four of these groups, that the businesses need to do the kind of homework that these folks have been doing, and at the same time, the financing isn't available. There was a lot of discussion about very specific recommendations around making finance available, not just financing for companies, but also financing for the, their partners, and financing for the landscape partnerships, um, activities that need to, need to happen. Um, there is also a significant piece on the landscape programs. Um, the first uh, 20 years, I mean, originally these landscape initiatives came from grassroots efforts mm -hmm. that scaled up efforts of multiple communities. Uh, then you get, a, I won't go into the whole history, but there's like five or six different trajectories for the development of landscape partnerships. But um, one of the things is that the vast majority of them in this 428 case examples that we have um, were um, convened by NGOs, local governments, maybe a regional authority, some indigenous people's organization, some grassroots, but you know, like 1% were company-led um, initiatives. And by and large, those groups either were too suspicious of agribusiness to invite them to come in, or they simply had no idea to do it. They'd invite them in and then their processes were so uncomfortable for the companies. They just weren't designed in a way, um, there was different kind of discourse. Mm -hmm. They got a reputation for just places that you got talk and as opposed to action, which wasn't true, but it was that perception by them. So I think we had a lot of recommendations in that action agenda for how the landscape programs need to be designed and to become much more expert internally with dealing with companies. Um, and then the last piece was this government piece. Governments are very ambivalent about wanting companies and their constituencies are ambivalent about having them be part of partnerships that are transforming landscapes. Yeah. That's, a, that's a key issue about sovereignty, et cetera. And I think uh, we just need to have the systematic efforts at sorting that out and governments need to take their own actions about what's legitimate and how to, how to partner with the, there were some places where it's actually illegal for companies to be part of landscape partnerships. Not many, but we found some cases. So I think there's a lot of, lot of action that could overcome a lot of those barriers, and clearly that's starting to happen. And so essentially what you're saying is we need to be better at putting together the different elements of the, the, the different constituencies together and providing a safe, neutral space for that to happen. And I think just being more intentional, I think it's well, Christopher mentioned the same thing, that they're just operating in different universes, and they need to sit together yeah. Just, kind of yeah. uh, uh, just on that, I mean, actually having a, a, a memorandum of understanding between the different actors. I mean, this is, I didn't go into our, our, our Sui River project, but there is a memorandum of understanding between ourselves as the company who is buying the cocoa, the village authorities, the Cocoa Board of Ghana, um, the, the Ministry of Forestry, um, and RA the Rainforest Alliance, and describing what each one of us is going to do. And that is kind of the foundational document, and we all work on that, and that's kind of, mm -hmm. so formalizing that is really important for a company. Yes, yeah, so very important to get the clarity of expectations of all mm -hmm. parties. Great, thank you. Miriam, um, obviously IUCN, you have a lot of practical experience of seeing these collaborations in action. In your view, what is needed to accelerate the scaling of these projects at the moment? So you gave some good examples of projects, and as did Sarah, you know, we had all the blobs ar around the world. But, you know, the approaches that everyone has talked about, you know, they're still not mainstream. Um, so in your view, what, you know, if you could have a magic wand and make a wish for one thing to change that would scale up some of the best practice that you are familiar with. What, what is that one thing or two things? Hmm. There are a couple of things, but okay, maybe if I had to choose the most relevant thing, I think it does come back to this very simple problem that was stated that we are operating in different 
hemispheres, mm. so to speak. Um, for example, we work a lot on scalable approaches and assessment, uh, barometer to track progress. All these things are scalable approaches, though locally adapted. And they have been very good at accelerating you know, action towards implementation of FLR uh, and bringing a lot of these partners together. But we do see that there's still some, some gaps there, I would say, to, to, to say it very gently. But I think that there's definitely still um, a bridge to be made between the, the larger corporate sectors, investors, and uh, these types of conversations that need to take place. So I'd, I, I think that would be something to change. We've seen very much uh, how we can actually guide investments in landscapes. We know that about 51% of smallholders together form, in fact, the largest private sector that there is. And we are working a lot with these uh, communities. We're uh, making sure that you know, there's an enabling environment and policies are put into place. And yet, I think we can still do a lot better on reaching uh, large corporations private sectors, investors, in, in, into these discussions. And I think certainly at GLF, having more businesses, entrepreneurs, and that type of thing happening is probably going to be critical. Because we can have all the information, mm -hmm. generate all the knowledge, do all the maths, so to speak. Uh, but then the implementation sits across a larger group of people. And I don't think we have them together yet. And. If you were put in front of the board of an agribusiness, not Christopher's, because they're already doing brilliant stuff, and you had to give one reason why the, the, this particular agribusiness needed to get involved in the implementation, what is your call to action? Why should they get involved? Um, well, I think the main reason to get involved is simply the recognition that their supply chain and what they're doing is not operating in isolation on a landscape and bring then to the fore what those other elements in the landscapes are that will directly impact the supply chains, but also how supply chains are impacting if done in a, in a more sustainable and perhaps landscape approach um, way, uh, how that would really benefit as well the uh, agribusiness. I'd just like to, to add to that because one of the things that came out of this BSL, this Business for Sustainable Landscapes initiative, was that companies weren't actually doing a very rigorous job of evaluating why or when or how they should. And one of the things we came out with is don't assume there's a theoretical justification for them to do that but before they're really going to commit. They need to do a lot of internal homework about where their vulnerabilities are, where their risks are, where the opportunities are, what their potentials and capacities are for engagement. So there's actually a kind of a fairly robust process that's required. And I think that's what you're starting to see is groups like IUCN and others that are really working, not coming in saying, hey, you guys, you got to be good guys and you got to be join our landscape uh, initiative, mm -hmm. but actually helping them to make the case internally um, for how to do that. Great. Thank you all very much. I promised you or threatened you, which I have whether you're feeling, <coughs> to come to you, the audience. Um, so remember, what we're trying to do is to tease out tips for building effective partnerships. So to bring together the corporates with the investors, with the local governments in a more meaningful way to drive the scaling of some of the practice we've been hearing about. So I'm kind of guiding your questions here, if I may. Um, but you know, if you want to ask other things as well, then that's okay. But you've only got about a quarter of an hour to do that. So who has a question for any of our panelists? And we have two roving mics. So yes, so we'll come over here to this lady and then we'll go behind. If you wouldn't mind speaking into the microphone and just sharing your name and your organization. Um, Varina Ingram from Wageningen University. So a question to the two businesses. I'm always interested in like the failures, huh? the what doesn't get set. The, the, I mean, we're hearing successful cases. So now without naming names or slinging mud, could you say like the lessons you've learned from your worst failures in partnerships? Um, question. Uh, that is a that is a tough one. I think actually one of the one of the big disappointments has been um, where we have gone in with expectations that the market would buy uh, product products that have been produced to high standards, uh, and actually we've found no real buyers. You know, and and that's a real 
Uh, that's a real disappointment for everybody, but I mean, it's not just us. If you look at, you know, for instance, the, uh, the round table on sustainable palm, um, uh, about 20% uh, about, uh, of the global volume of palm oil is now certified, but half of the certified volumes just doesn't get sold as certified. And that is partly because uh, people want cheap food, and partly because uh, the people, so the producers, are typically not selling directly to, to customers. They're going through the intermediaries of manufacturers and retailers, and the manufacturers and retailers are, are simply not prepared to make their food, uh, to put on a, a premium that reflects the cost of, of, of that food. So I think, uh, I don't think we've got you know, like standout examples of terrible failures in partnerships. Obviously, you know, you've got ups and downs, but it's where expectations of the market uh, uptake of, of uh, certified or sustainable foods haven't been met, and that's a real downer for everybody. Because what's the point of doing more if people won't, you know, buy the great story? Yeah, and that story I think reflects where we are in this journey. But I think we're all assuming that that will change. But Gox. Again. Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking what, what I can say here, but I think in you know in the early stages of GAR's sustainability journey, I think uh, what has failed uh, was when we were essentially you know, forced into partnerships where we didn't have uh, much choice left than to participate. And so we were following uh, a, a very kind of narrow interest from a specific project partner in that area because we believed that uh, partner had the right um, uh, knowledge and, and know-how in that area. And, and so I thought those were the ones which were uh, kind of set up in, in failure. Um, I, think, I think then the other ones, uh, and, and that is, was actually related to uh, doing conservation stuff top down, ignoring communities are around, so essentially setting up a fence around some forests and try to protect them. I think so that was, that was failure. I think um, we, we don't have the expectation. I think we are <laughs> realistic enough that we don't hope for price premiums from whatever we do. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we are over that kind of dream. <laughs> yeah, but I suppose, you know, we could hope that the ultimate business case that actually the market ultimately will reward sustainable commodities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. um, great, and then there's another question just behind, and yeah, and then I'll come over to this gentleman here. So, sorry, just behind you, the lady in the white scarf. Hi, my name is Sherelle Quayle, and I've worked in contract farming in cotton and tobacco in East Africa. So I have some comments to this. Um, I think in the supply chain, in cotton and textiles is a perfect example. The production cost is a third party or second party supplier, the ones on the ground producing, growing cotton, are small, and yet the expectations of, of sustainability fall on those, those suppliers. And yet the real margins and the people who refuse to pay for that are higher on the supply chain. Retailers, for example, their profit margins, or tobacco with Philip Morris. The amount of profit that Philip Morris makes on a cigarette compared to what a merchant <coughs> and a processor makes is, is a huge difference between the two. And yet, who wants to pay for the sustainability cost is one. I think it's not just consumer driven, <coughs> it's, the, it's the people or the companies at the end of the supply chain, retailers, for example. <coughs> Secondly, um, the cost in sustainability is not, is, in landscapes, there's competition with the ILO, with labor practices, with child labor. And so when you're on the ground every week or every month, you know, somebody's flying in the next consultant with the next expectation here, we want you to do this, and your costs keep going up and up. It becomes more stressful, it's harder to, to implement. So I think with landscapes, People should keep in mind too that there's just increasing expectations and the umbrella of sustainability is ever expanding. It's good, but it's difficult to implement on the ground. Um, <clears throat> so can we just take your first question because I'm quite keen to get others, okay. other voices in. So there was a very definite question there, which if I may just reframe it um, ever so slightly so we can get straight to the issue. I think behind your question was, how do we try and ensure greater value capture at production? Um, and how do we do that? Because it's clearly a challenge in most commodities right now. Sarah, you're nodding vigorously, which makes but me hopeful that you have an answer. The question is, um, I think 
what I would say is that we are still at a very early stage in trying to make these partnerships work. So like in any situation, those early set of things are, uh, there's so much trial and error that's going on, so much figuring out what the solutions are that they are high cost. I think we need to be challenging ourselves, businesses, landscape programs, governments, and others explicitly to respond to that question. We need to make the cost of doing things sustainably significantly lower, especially, I mean, what I hear from the agribusiness, it's the transaction costs, it's the, you know, the regulatory stuff, it's engaging with the partners, that's where a lot of the cost is, and I think that that we will, we should be able to get some more a measure of, of, of improvement. I would just warn one other thing, I think there is a little bit of a shell game going on in some of these landscape partnerships, in that when we talk to them about why they're doing it privately, a lot of companies get into it because they really want other people to finance key aspects of sustainability rather than themselves, mm -hmm. but then you go to the governments or you go to the landscape programs and why are they inviting the, land, the, the companies in because they think they're rich and they think they'll cover the costs of, of, of the partnership activities. And I think being very transparent about what these costs are, how can we bring the costs down, that we're really in a process of co-financing what's needed at the landscape scale. We can't have unrealistic expectations of agribusiness, um, but they, they can't have unrealistic expectations of what it's gonna cost other partners either, so. And in your view, what's the practical step forward to that more inclusive co-financing model? I think we need to look at a lot of different models. I actually don't think we have an answer to that because no one has systematically looked at it. Maybe that's something that GAA uh, might be interested yeah. to do. I mean, I know we have run a project at Forum called Cotton 2040. So we are working with the entire cotton industry, um, looking at how we can harmonize the language and terminology that's used by the cotton standards. So that often duplication you get at primary production will hopefully cease because it's much harder if you're answering multiple questionnaires which are essentially asking the same question. Okay, I'm keen to go to this gentleman here, then I'll come over to this side of the room. If you could be quick with your question, that would be great. I'll, I'll try. Michael from Cell Ventures, we manage the Ant Green Fund with a mandate to invest in the delinking of uh, commodity production from deforestation. Um, and that what I wanted to do is I wanted to drill down a little bit on this uh, point of trust that got mentioned. Um, you know, that needs to be there for investors uh, to bring money to these landscapes. Now, trust is a thing that goes both ways. Um, and, and, you know, if we want to deal with the problem at the scale that is needed, we need to build investable models that, you know, commercial investors have to trust that they get their money back when they invested in these landscapes. And I wanted to know from the companies on the panel, but also actually from all the panelists, what models for building that trust for investors would you suggest um, we develop and explore? Great, thank you. Christopher Gotts? Uh, so, I, as, as an established agribusiness, um, our, I think the trust is built through understanding, uh, and, and obviously we have commercial loans for our sustainability business all the time, uh, with uh, with commercial banks, typically what we've been doing with you know through those uh, through through those financing is looking at farmer livelihoods. So we have a, a, a farmer livelihood program called the Olam Livelihood Charter. We we work with 375,000 smallholders. Last year we lent those smallholders uh, 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 around 300 uh, sorry around 300 million dollars at 0 percent interest. So at our risk, and there's obviously there's nothing you can do to get that money back if they decide to default. But the, so it's built into our our business model that we are ourselves lending directly to smallholders who are our suppliers, so that they can invest in their crops, uh, whether it's inputs, fertilizers, etc. So I mean, if you're looking for uh, if you're looking for commercial partners who can. Uh, a build a big enough sort of project that's bankable and where you could come in uh, to finance some other aspects of that, then you have to look at the business model and the track record of the business that you're, uh, that you're proposing to go into partnership with. Um, I think the, the big challenge for us, as I've mentioned, is that, and a couple of other people have said, is that we as a business are, are very good and experienced at, at investing in the bits of the overall sustainability that makes sense to us, which is making farmers, uh, helping farmers to produce more, to get more yield, to get better quality produce, 
and that can include some very beneficial things for the environment on the, within the farm. So shade tree, uh, shade tree and cocoa and, and uh, coffee, um, mulching, soil improvement, less use of fertilizers and pesticides, etc. What we're what we're much less good at is investing beyond the farm gate, even though we know that in order to secure the supply of produce for the long term, we need that whole landscape to work, not just the farm uh, and the farmer's little piece of land, but the farming community and the watershed catchment mm -hmm. and local climate. So that's where we need new models, I think, mm -hmm. uh, to safeguard that entire system. Great. Just a time check. We did start 10 minutes late, so we have got another 10 minutes. I hope that's okay with everybody. Clearly, if you can't stay, then that's fine. But I didn't want to shortchange you all. We said we'd run this session for an hour and a half. So we had a question, and you're already, I can see, you have a microphone. Brilliant. Yes, thank you. Um, these living landscapes, they're still an open system, so you still have to deal with some of the uh, consequences of fertilizer runoff or soil erosion. Sorry, your name and organization? I'm Trevor Weiss. And I work for a small marketing project for an urban farm, Survival of the Fishest. Um, what kind of direction do you guys see urban farming, such as hydroponics or aquaponics systems going? What kind of direction is this industry headed? Wow. Who'd like to comment on I that? I have no idea. <laughs> this kind of question. No, you go ahead. I'll... Um, <laughs> Because I've spent most of my life working with farmers in rural areas, um, I would like to see the mobilization of investment be primarily um, around that. I think farmers are the stewards of our natural resources, and if we divert a lot of stuff to urban farming, I think urban farming is really important, and I think it's growing naturally of its own uh, for a lot of economic reasons, but I don't think there's personally any reason to be promoting it particularly or to focus. I'm uh, quite concerned that a lot of the sort of innovative, regenerative investors right now are saying, oh, look how cool, let's do this stuff in hydroponics and let's do it in, in town. And they're not looking at alternatives in terms of investing. We, the investment thing's a big thing, that's a passion of, of ours right now, but we need to make the investment case for sustainable landscapes and we're still far from having made that we need to do our homework, and that response to the gentleman before who was speaking. We need to show we don't have the track record, and that's the big thing they worry about. But if you can show actually good cash flow models, and if you can show who the partners are that are securing things, but most landscapes have not done that homework. And the stuff you all have done is just the beginning of showing there is potential profitability, but building the investment case for, for actual actors is something we're not there. So anyway, it's a great thing. It's going to grow. Super. I guess Don't let it the investment, though, is that it does use less water and it is a more efficient form of farming in, I guess, a perfect world. So it can be, it can be, but also farmers are the main stewards of our landscapes. They are protecting our watershed when they do regenerative farming, when they do regenerative forestry. So that's the, the, what's the term that you were using? That's the positive. Net positive. The, the net positive piece. And so I don't want to see them competing. I think they're both needed, and, but let's not, not put them in competition. But what, what do we have? I mean, I think that's the point. We, we need all forms of agriculture, yes. Um, so any specific other thoughts on investment into, you know, alternative forms of agriculture, hydroponics, aquaculture, or shall we move on? We're going to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to the gentleman um, with his hand up. If we can pass. So I'm liking this collaborative working here and moving the microphone around. Yes, Thanks sir. a lot. Um, Moise Forer from Solidaridad, Germany. I have a question to the representative of the private sector. Um, thank you very much for the great examples you have put up here. Now, um, how difficult is it for you to be bringing these concepts to the higher management in your companies? Um, because we are not seeing these concepts being, being really the mainstream uh, being implemented by, by the companies. Can you tell a little bit more on why this is not yet the case? I, I, I think in that case which I presented, that's a, a relative easy one, um, because we are obviously recruiting the majority of our workforce who works for us in the plantations from these local communities, and uh, because we have a we run on a 25-year uh, kind of rotation cycle, so we would like to work um, with these communities in the long term. And, and so therefore, it, it is clearly seen 
as an investment into our neighbors, if you will, and if we have a good relationship with them, um, 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 obviously then there will be not so many problems for us uh, in, in the future. Um, again, that's why I said it's very important that you know where you are working, in which landscapes um, you need to understand what they need, then it's possible. If you obviously go for a very large scale, let's call, you know, province level landscape, then uh, it will be a very difficult uh, sell to my top management, uh, to, be, to be honest. Um, I think there needs to be a very clear financial benefit, otherwise uh, we would uh, hesitate a lot to invest in a, in a large scale landscape project. And so de facto then, is the assumption that the reason why we're not seeing a huge swathe of corporates take the approach that your two organizations is, is that that understanding of the long-term impacts isn't as clear as it needs to be. It's not, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, um, oh, well, yeah. yes, Christopher. So, uh, I think uh, th there's a sort of a risk, a risk management element to it, but uh, the discussion within, within OLAM is about what is the long-term uh, value proposition for, for our company? What is our business proposition and what do we offer our, our, our own shareholders? And our shareholders are long-term shareholders. We have, uh, we have the, the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Singapore, Temasek, uh, and we've got Mitsubishi Corporation who between them own uh, around 70% of our, um, our business. And our proposition, so they're thinking in 30, 50 year um, uh, investment uh, horizons. They're not thinking about the next quarter. And what they have agreed with our, with our senior management is that they want to see us securing the supply of commodities from these landscapes for the long term. And we know that things like, you know, whether you look at cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire or you look at coffee all over the sort of tropics, that climate change is, a, is, is actually a, a key threat to the long term security of supply. And unless we address the resilience of those uh, of those farming communities and those ecosystems, then our supply of those key commodities is going to dry up. So it's actually it's a survival uh, imperative for us to look at, you know, what is the what is going to keep these uh, these commodities going and keep farmers on the farms uh, as part of the rural matrix. So it's really not just uh, it's not just a PR uh, exercise. It's about what is the you know what's the survival of our company look like in, in 20 or 30 years time. Yeah, and it's great to see that. And one is wondering why others just can't quite see that completely impeccable logic, which is if we don't take a long-term view, actually we undermine the resilience of our agricultural system. So we had a couple, so there's a couple of hands up over here. Um, or we, so, Yes, I was going to say, I thought I caught your eye. If we could just go to this lady here, then this gentleman, then I know there was someone else over here. Um, so can you have the microphone over here, please? And again, if you can keep your question short, because I would quite like to get at least three more questions in the time that we have. Um, yeah. yeah, I was wondering. Your name? Uh, Lisa, sorry. <laughs> uh, Lisa from Wageningen University, a student environmental science policy. Um, I was wondering, in the beginning of this um, lecture, interactive session, I had the feeling that we heard a bit of a different narrative than we do now. When Christopher started off, he, he started the reason for sustainable um, activities within his company, also from a point of view that he didn't want to contribute as a human being to more degradation, at least that's the point that I uh, got out of it. And after which uh, it shifted more that money especially was the important factor for businesses to shift towards uh, sustainable practices. I was wondering, is there any room within businesses for that first narrative? So we as human beings should yeah. take responsibility for, um, well. Thank you for that question. Really lovely question there. So the importance <laughs> of Perhaps an doing the right question, thing. But <laughs> um, so yeah, what I mean, say a word about Sunny, because I don't think Sunny is primarily, I mean, you talk about your CEO, but what I hear when I hear him talk is a very personal motivation for wanting to do the right thing. Uh, yeah, so I think it, it's really about aligning what makes a business tick and what is motivating and engaging the people who work for that business. And I think that if you, 
speak to any, I mean, that, that's, I think that's why I work for Olam, is it's such an exciting business to work for because our CEO is personally passionate about sustainability, but he has completely uh, constructed a, a, you know, the, uh, the, the shareholder narrative around what the long-term value of sustainability as a business model. And, and so it's, you know, our personal motivation aligns with the, uh, the business model that's been conceived. Those two things aren't necessarily um, uh, conflicting. Obviously, if you come into a position where your personal values are directly conflicting with what your company does, you're not going to last with that company and your company is probably not going to retain the sorts of valuable staff that, uh, that a company needs to in order to thrive. So, uh, I think uh, I think that's th that would be the answer. I think you're not. It, it's not a conflicting situation. It's actually trying to align the business, um, the business imperative with the personal motivation of the people who work for, work for you. Great, thank you. We'll go over here and then yes, if we can have the, the microphone. We've got a second microphone. Have that ready just over there. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. My name is Petri Lehtonen, and I, I come from FAO. I'm a forest finance expert. So actually, I, th I would like to kind of revisit the question of partnerships when you asked about what are the critical factors. I like the answer, but I would like to further elaborate that why actually you didn't mention government. I mean, you have been mentioning government, but I think that government hasn't been really that important in this discussion. So it be quite important for me to know that how do you see government's role in these yeah. partnerships? Um, really great call out. And I think a few of you did talk about the importance of government. If I go to Miriam, actually, um, how important is government in this endeavor and how can we really leverage them as an act of a change more meaningfully? Yeah, I think that um, governments and are very important. I mean, the public-private partnerships uh, that are possible are already growing more and more, I think, in this sector. Um, and I think, in particular, governments, um, well, putting up policies and uh, strategies and plans in place in which this can operate is obviously very important. But the other part of that is also just the financing, the public finance that's going towards um, towards uh, sustainable supply chains. I think that we've got quite a lot of examples of how national uh, <coughs> environmental trusts are set up to de-risk or to provide uh, initial funds. We know that, for example, for smallholders to access loans is very, very difficult. Uh, so we've, like, for example, in Rwanda, established uh, a climate smart lending platform as well for the kind of um, medium uh, medium holders and so I think that governments are actually putting up a lot of the shall I say seed funding mm -hmm. to start uh, up these types of partnerships with the private sector it's a lot about de-risking uh, but it's also about a lot of trust building I think between the different partners as we progress there are a lot of new models uh, coming out of how this new business can be done I think we have a lot of the evidence mm -hmm. to do it um, in my experience, companies are quite happy to put up the funds once the kind of evidence yeah. there is built, but it often requires a first initial input of, of funding that governments have been exceptionally good at, at taking on at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Great. I've realized I've sorry, sorry, almost... Maybe <coughs> just one thing on government. Really quickly, because we are very, out very of quickly. time. I think what is very important in Indonesia or in other emerging countries, you need to keep the government informed about what you are planning to do but don't try them to make the engine of the change, right? Because governments think in four or five year cycles. And we see in North America right now very clearly how individual new <laughs> people in charge can change what you're uh, talking about. very quickly what their predecessors have uh, achieved. Um, so, I, I, yeah, inform them, but don't make them the engines of the change. Great. I think I know there was another question over there, but you're going to have to grab these people at another moment because I know two of them have got to give another talk at six yes. o'clock. Um, what I would just like to do now is two things. I want to ask each of you in turn, starting with Miriam, the one thing that makes you feel optimistic, because at the moment all the science is making me feel a little bit pessimistic, so the one thing that you see is giving you cause for optimism, and then I've got seven top tips for building effective partnerships to share with you. They spell scaling, by the way, so I'm having some fun up here. So one cause for optimism, Miriam. 
well, there's lots of causes for optimism. So I work on, on Rome and I think only in opportunity, so <laughs> it's a bit of a habitual thing. But I think that um, private sector is realizing more and more their, the interdependency of the different actors on landscapes. We are seeing lots of stories coming out. We see, I see a lot of actual change coming also from governments uh, and building these public-private partnerships, I think, is going to be a big thing coming up. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I think that people are becoming, I'm optimistic because I think people are addressing these partnerships as in their particu particularities and looking at what's actually happening in a particular landscape and a particular set of opportunities. And I think that allows people to move out of what are sometimes their, their, their intrinsic trust, issues of trust and, and, and distrust and knowledge of one another. And I think we have a lot of tools now that can lubricate the relationships between these partners. So I think um, things are so much better than they were five years ago in this space of, of involving The specificity of application. Yeah. Great. Got. You know, I think also there is now a better joint common understanding, right, on, on what the targets are, how to get there, what each and every uh, party involved can or has to contribute to, to reach that target, and, and that makes me optimistic. Great. Christopher. Uh, I'm going to repeat what uh, my CEO said a couple of weeks ago in Utrecht. I, what, what I find incredible is, is the enthusiasm of young people for this area and the way that they're using technology to inform themselves and to inform us about what they want. And as somebody who interviews you know, people on a regular basis for jobs around our company, it's incredible the, the passion that people bring to this particular area. So you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic that, that, that people will bring that passion to our company as well. Great, thank you. So four reasons to be cheerful. Um, and then seven tips, if I may, uh, just trying to summarize our discussion. Uh, and these do spell scaling. So as I say, I have some fun over here. So the first top tip for effective partnerships to drive living landscapes is S for supply chain risk. Spell this out to create a really watertight investment case. C is to clarify expectations of all partners, parties, maybe go even as far as having an MOU. This will help build trust. Um, a is for alter the risk appetite. This may funnel more investment into landscape-based schemes. L, thank you, Got, is for local understanding, critical for effective partnerships. I is for integrate conservation and development needs in the same frame. I added N. N is for net positive outcomes. Be really clear about what good looks like when we're designing these approaches. And then G is for give and take. And what I mean by that is I think what we need to get better at doing is to experiment, learn, and adapt. Because I think that will enable the development of a different business model, which will allow us to drive this impact at scale. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the audience. You're free to go wherever you, you feel to go thank next. You. Thank but you thank very you. much.